Chow, Dean of Libraries at Vanderbilt, and I'm thrilled to welcome you tonight to our to Vanderbilt and to our community room. Uh, we are going to be looking back at an important event in Governor Alexander's years in Tennessee as governor as they began. The program is one of the, uh, along with the exhibit, Come On Along, is one of the ways we're celebrating the uh, gift of the papers of Senator and Mrs. Alexander. We're very proud that um, Vanderbilt Library is the home of those, and many of those are uh, in the exhibit uh, that I hope you'll see tonight or come back and see. Uh, I wanna thank you for coming. What a distinguished audience we have here tonight. I can't recognize everyone, but I do want to say it is always nice to see Mayor Dean and Congressman Cooper in the audience. Thank you for coming. <laughs> this program is co-sponsored by the Vanderbilt <coughs> Law School and my terrific colleague, Dean Chris Guthrie is here. I hope you'll meet him tonight. I also want to recognize Kiel Hunt, uh, Nashville civic leader, and tell you that he is finishing the definitive book that should come out soon on this very subject. Watch for the notice of the release. Someone who I thought was a dear, dear friend of mine told me that I have about four minutes or less to introduce the most distinguished panel that I'll ever have an opportunity to introduce. <clears throat> so I'm gonna ask you many times tonight to forgive me for that. Uh, in 1978, Lamar Alexander, a 1962 graduate of Vanderbilt University, walked a thousand miles across Tennessee and finally into the governor's mansion. Reelected in 82, he became the first Tennessean elected to consecutive four-year terms as governor. In 2002, he was elected to the seat of retiring Senator Fred Thompson, becoming the only Tennessean ever popularly elected both governor and U.S. Senator. Alexander was reelected again in 2007. I guess I should stop there with that. And somewhere in between, he had successful careers uh, in as an attorney in business, he was U.S. Secretary of Education, President of the University of Tennessee, Professor of Harvard's School of Government, and authored many, many works. Hal Hardy, a 68th graduate of Vanderbilt Law School, was appointed by Governor Ray Blanton as presiding judge on the circuit court for Davidson County in 1975. In July 77, he was appointed by President Jimmy Carter to serve as a U.S. Attorney for Tennessee. Today, Mr. Hardin is in private practice here in Nashville. Justice William Koch, Jr., the 72 graduate of Vanderbilt Law School, was Deputy Attorney General for the state of Tennessee in 1979. He was appointed to the Tennessee Supreme Court in 2007 after serving 23 years on the Tennessee Court of Appeals. He's taught law school at Nashville School of Law in Vanderbilt and is now also in private <coughs> practice. The Honorable Fred Thompson, 67 graduate of Vanderbilt Law School, we're pleased to welcome you back tonight, served as minority counsel to the Watergate Committee 73 to 74. He represented Marie Rangatini in the wrongful termination Rishani. suit, Rashani, yeah. in the wrongful Return, law, wrongful termination suit against Governor Ray Blanton and won the case in 78. His first acting role was portraying the attorney representing Marie. He was elected to complete Al Gore's Senate term in 1994, then re-elected. He continues to appear on screen regularly in some of television's highest rated programs. Attorney General Robert Cooper Jr. Graduated from Princeton and from Yale? <laughs> Not Vanderbilt? Oh, wait, 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 wait. He taught at Vanderbilt Law School. <laughs> now I see. Okay. During 19 years in private practice, he became Tennessee's Attorney General and Recorder <clears throat> in 2006, serving as legal counsel for Governor Bredesen. Fortunately, our moderator, John Siegenthaler, also a Vanderbilt grad, really needs no introduction, fortunately, because I'm over time. 
But now I will simply turn the program over to the renowned publisher, articulate host of Word of Words, author and contributor to several books, Wikipedia scholar, founder of the First <laughs> Amendment Center, and political and civil rights figure, John Siegenthaler. Uh, thank you, Connie, very much. <laughs> I, I uh, on behalf of all my colleagues, Connie, we thank you for that <laughs> wonderful introduction. <clears throat> and um, before I begin, I must confess, in preparation for tonight, I have repeatedly interrupted the vacation of, of Keel Hunt, uh, who, as Connie said, has written the definitive book um, on the events we're going to revisit tonight. Um, and if I make mistakes, um, blame it on Keel. Uh, <laughs> And I also, you know, there's so many people in this audience I've seen uh, as you've come in and earlier um, downstairs, uh, and it's dangerous even to begin mentioning them, but it would be a crime uh, if I did not uh, single out one person, and that's Louis Donaldson, who played such a vital and key role in the events that transpired. The early asking of rape, and Louis, would you just stand up and let us take a look at you? You ought to, you should be up here. Well, the early end of the town, uh, of the term of Ray Blanton and the early swearing in of uh, Lamar Alexander was a moment, a moment of constitutional crisis. It required wisdom, character, courage, by all of you who were involved in it, and that includes Louis, of course. It's a moment of unprecedented, but largely unremembered, it is, by people who didn't live it. Uh, now, in the, weeks, in the weeks leading up to the end of the term of Governor Blanton and the inaugural, scheduled inaugural, of Governor Alexander, <coughs> There had been many accurate press reports and rumors that a major FBI investigation was underway into the Blanton administration's selling of pardons and prison clemency to inmates of the penitentiary, many of whom were perpetrators of heinous crimes. Focal point of the news reporting <laughs> involved Governor Blanton's determination, and it was determined, and he was determined to pardon Roger Humphrey as a young convict serving 40 years for the brutal murder of his former wife and her boyfriend. He shot him 18 times with a two-shot Derringer pistol, believe it or not. The media was mesmerized by the fact that this pardon would be a crass political payoff to Humphrey's father, a staunch Blanton supporter, and a Blanton fundraiser in East Tennessee. But the Humphreys case was just the tip of the iceberg of corruption. Both the media and the rumor mill had circulated <clears throat> reports of the pardon by cash investigation that had been pursued over a period of weeks and months by the FBI. It appeared that perhaps a dozen pardons or grants of clemency, if you listen to the reporters of the rumor mill, um, were about uh, to be brought about and that uh, and that Governor Blanton was about to spring the release of numerous inmates. It's not unusual to hear journalists and politicians say the governor planned to empty the prison before leaving office as the date of the inaugural approach. Uh, governor Blanton astounded the state. He confirmed on the evening of January 15th that the rumors were reality. He let it be known he already had approved and signed 15 clemency, 52, 52 clemency requests in a single <clears throat> evening. That confirmed the worst fears of Democratic state government officials, House Speaker Ned McWhorter, Governor John Wilder, uh, State Attorney General Bill Leach. They realized there might still be more coming. Beyond the news media reporting and the rumor mill rumbling, there had been this intense FBI investigation and also a federal sting in which Eddie Sist, the governor's legal counsel, had been ensnared two weeks earlier, videotaped taking a cash payoff 
in order to provide a pardon to a convicted murderer, a double murderer, named Eddie Dallas Denton. Take all that as background. <coughs> now, um, now let me stop for a moment, for a few moments. Uh, there is a video we're now going to view that really sort of puts what the panel is about in perspective. Uh, we're about to see the events as they unfolded on January 17th, two days after the signing of those 52 pardons and petitions for clemency. Let's take a look at the screen. The year 1979. 39-year-old Governor-elect Lamar Alexander walks grim-faced into the Tennessee Capitol. Alexander will be doing what hasn't been done before in 185 years of Tennessee history. Seize power from a sitting governor. The reason? The U.S. Attorney believes state inmates may soon be released from prison by Governor Ray Blanton after paying members of Blanton's staff for pardons. Prison will be witnessing the swearing in of the 45th uh, governor of Tennessee. Speaker of the Senate is directly behind Mr. Alexander. Edward McWhorter is directly behind him. Attorney General Spahn and Gentry Crown is right behind them. We're expecting them to be sworn in right now. These are not very happy days for Tennessee. This is not a happy day for me. I believe, though, that we have been responsible and that we have kept the faith of the people by this decision. We seek the people's wisdom. If we hear the people's wisdom, our days of agony can soon go forward to days of pride. I ask for the prayers of the people. Mr. Chief Justice, I'm ready to take the oath of office. Please place your left hand upon the Bible. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Lamar Alexander. I, Lamar Alexander. Well, as you saw, live on Channel 5 at 5.55 p.m., the state of Tennessee received a new governor, Governor Lamar Alexander. The ceremony was held in the state Supreme Court building with Chief Justice Joe Henry presiding and was preceded by brief statements by a governor-elect at that time, Lamar Alexander, stating why he was doing what he was doing and taking the oath of office. And standing by his side were Democrats John Wilder and Ed Ray McWhorter, and then the oath of office administered by Chief Justice Joe Henry of the uh, state uh, Supreme Court. Honey Alexander, his wife, you see, to uh, Governor Alexander's right, holding uh, the Bible and the administration of the oath. And say, so help me God. So help me God. Let's pray. Almighty God, there is no more solemn responsibility than the responsibilities of government. Guide us in our decisions. Help us to understand our will and respond to it. Bless the state. Bless our new governor. Direct him and all our public officials to provide the leadership and the quality of government which our people deserve. Help us to govern in the true spirit of thy word. Amen. Governor, with uh, only three days left in Governor Bland's term, why was it so imperative that you take office now? Uh, the United States Attorney for the Middle District of Tennessee called me at noon and said he had uh, substantial reason to believe that Governor Blanton was about to let out of a state prison one or more persons uh, who were the targets of a grand jury investigation into alleged payoffs uh, in connection with pardons and paroles. With that information, I concluded immediately, as I suppose the Speaker and the Lieutenant Governor must have too, that that was new and specific information that demanded that I act that I could. What's your feeling tonight? Well, I think it's uh, in many ways a very sad moment in Tennessee, but in many other ways it's a great moment. It will be recorded that Ray Blanton was his own worst enemy. I think he brought this on himself. I don't think there was any other viable choice. I think the United States Attorney today did what he had to do, 
and when they heard from the United States Attorney, I think that Lamar Alexander and the rest did what they had to do. The Attorney General, who assured me uh, during the afternoon that if I took office under these circumstances, it was constitutionally valid as an assumption of office. Uh, after the information had been presented to each of us, uh, we talked by telephone and agreed uh, that this would be uh, in the best interest of the people. That's, from my perspective, uh, how this occurred. We now have Ben Keeler standing by at the State Supreme Court building with Lieutenant Governor John Wilder for an interview. When the United States District Attorney called myself and Mr. Clerla and, uh, and Governor Alexander and advised us that he had uh, certain information that uh, led him to believe that there were a number of persons that were going to be pardoned and or commuted uh, shortly, uh, we had no choice. So we acted. When uh, did Governor Blanton uh, find out that this ceremony was going to take place? I'm advised that uh, he was advised of this uh, shortly before it happened by Attorney General Leach. Hank Allison is standing by there with uh, the Speaker of the House and Ed Ray McWhorter. Hank? The man you just swore in is a Republican. Uh, you are a Democrat, and, and most of the people who, who participated in the decision to swear him in early are Democrats. The man, I'm excited, the man you know, first out of Tennessee, and I think this is in the interest of Tennessee, regardless of the party. Thank you very much, sir. You know, as I, uh, as I watched Louis Donaldson re recite that prayer, it reminded me how old I am. <laughs> um, well, so it was, as we've just seen, that on Wednesday, April 17th, United States Attorney Hal Hardin uh, learned from an FBI agent that there might be 30 more pardons or clemencies that were in the process of being signed and no assurance that beyond that there would not be more. Um, Hal's dilemma, he knew what the FBI knew. Now as he worried about it, he wondered what if anything he could do to stop it. More, maybe many more state crimes were about to be committed but he was a federal official answerable to Griffin Bell, the Attorney General of the United States. The embodiment of federal power in Tennessee, but still helpless. This was not, after all, federal business. But should he talk to the Attorney General in Washington? Well, he didn't. He picked up the telephone and called Governor Alexander. And so I must begin with the first question uh, to you, Senator. Um, I know, um, because I've talked to Keel Hunt about it, <laughs> and he's talked to you about it, I know that you were hesitant to do what Hal Hardin suggested that you do. Um, hesitant about taking office three days early. I'd like to ask you why you were hesitant, <clears throat> and how did you come to put aside that hesitancy and take the oath that you just deserved? Thanks, John, and thanks to uh, Vanderbilt for doing this, and thanks to everyone for being on the panel. This is uh, particularly to Hal Hardin. If there's a hero in the crowd, it's uh, I've always thought it was Hal in this case, and despite the fact we've known each other uh, over the years, we've even taken our daughters on uh, Girl Scout camping trips back, in, back years ago. Uh, we've never talked about this. Uh, uh, in any detail over that time. So I'm as interested as you are in hearing what he has to say because if you can imagine this, we were all in our own places um, and doing different things. So most of what you're about to hear, I'm uh, probably about to hear for the first time. Why was I, John asked, why was I hesitant? Hesitant is a great understatement. <laughs> I mean, put yourself in those shoes. I mean, here it was Wednesday. I'd been working for five years to be governor. I'd walked across the state, thanked everybody. Um, I thought all this had tamped down a little bit because, as John reported, it was stirred up on Monday night by the governor granting 52 pardons. 
And then I get this telephone call. I'm by myself. I think I may have been with Louie at the time in a little office over at Shoney's on Hobbs Road. I'm, it's the first day I've had uh, by myself. I was working on my inaugural address, a few things about putting the administration together, perhaps the budget. I guess that's why Louie was, was there. I get a call from Hal Harden, who I knew, but not well, and he said, um, Lamar, I'm, this is Hal Harden. We have information that the governor is about to release a number of prison prisoners. The FBI has information that the, F, that, that, that the governor is about to release a number of prisoners who have paid cash for their release. Will you take office uh, early to stop him? It's about what he said. My best recollection, recollection, and you're going to hear some different recollections probably tonight because it's been a long time, was that I said, thank you, Hal. Well, let me call you back. I called him back in a few minutes for two reasons. One was to make sure it was him. <laughs> and not some prankster like John Sigenthal or something. <laughs> and two, to give me a moment to think. Because I was hesitant, and for three reasons. Uh, one, um, we don't do that in the United States. Uh, I went through Mount Vernon uh, earlier this year and the tour guide quoted George Washington as saying that the most important thing about this new experiment speaking to our country was not the first president but the second. The election of the second, the peaceful trans <coughs> transfer of power from one to the other. I didn't know that quote but I was steeped in that as most Americans are so we don't we don't do things like that. We, 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 we have in our minds you know, Johnson to Nixon, all this power peacefully in a ceremony, and we accept that. Second, um, uh, um, personally, I didn't want to do it. Uh, I mean, we had, it, it turned, as Honey later said, a celebration <clears throat> into a funeral. I mean, we'd been working for five years, assembled, a group of people were looking forward to the Saturday schedule to launch things. My parents were in East Tennessee. I mean, these may seem like trivial things. My, we were dead tired. Honey was in the, we were moving that day to the governor's mansion. Honey was pregnant with Will. She had three, we had three children, you know, under 10. Uh, one was sick that day. The house was empty. She was sitting there waiting for us to make our minds up about whether we were gonna move into the governor's mansion that night. And, and there were all these people had been planning to come, bands had practiced, you know, there were all these things that made that difficult personally. And then there was a third thing, which was, um, I remember telling Tom Ingram uh, shortly after I heard from Hal, I said, this is the kind of thing where 100 things could go wrong and 90, 99 of them probably will. And so there I was, and I'm trying to answer Keel's question to me and John's just now, hesitant? I mean, I've been trying to think of a word to describe how you feel when you're presented suddenly with something that you know shouldn't be done, uh, that you don't absolutely don't want to do, that you think if you do it, 99 of 100 things that could go wrong probably would, yet you inevitably, you know inevitably that you're probably going to have to do it. The only word I could think of was a word my grandmother used to use. I was in a pickle. <laughs> it's not a very elegant yeah. word, but it was a high-class pickle. It's probably how Davy Crockett felt about the Alamo, you know. Don't want to do it. <laughs> It'll probably go wrong, but I've got to do it. So the whole rest of the afternoon, I was hesitant, absolutely. I imagine every single person involved in it was very hesitant about it. But at the same time, very shortly after... I heard from Hal, I knew down deep in my gut I would have to do it. And I spent most of the rest of the afternoon trying to work out all these, trying to make it work out as, as best it could and, and have as few of those 99 things that might go wrong did. And fortunately, there were four or five other broad-gauged, well-intentioned people, some of whom who are here tonight, uh, who were working hard to do that. And we can talk more about that later. But I. Hesitant, yes. I was in a pickle, a high-class pickle. I was felt the way Davy Crockett must have felt and uh, didn't want to do it, shouldn't <clears throat> do it. Everything could go wrong, but I knew pretty quickly I inevitably had to do it. Lamar, you and I have talked 
in the past about the value, um, the need and the value for informed, candid a staff around you. Um, I know Louis was there. I know Tom Ingram must have been there. On whom did you rely? I mean, your gut's telling you what you must do. But did you talk to staff? <coughs> did you seek advice from your immediate friends and closest advisors, including uh, your best friend, Honey Alexander? I did, of course I talked to Honey about it. I called her right away and she was sitting there in a very cold house, pregnant with a sick child and two more coming home from school, all the boxes at the governor's mansion, wondering why in the world we couldn't make our mind up about what we were gonna do. <laughs> um, I mainly talked to Louie and Tom. Uh, I didn't talk to almost anybody else during that time. I talked, called Hal back. But I was very fortunate to have uh, with me, I mean, people used to kid me about Louis Donaldson because then he was 60 years old. He's 95 this year. And, uh, and I was 38. I was the only Republican in a sea of Democrats. It's hard to imagine how Democratic the state was at the time. And so I relied, you know, people said, well, if you have Louis, is your first appointee and your chief operating officer, he'll run over you. And I knew better than that because he was a lawyer and he would serve his client, but he, he, he knew the town pretty well. I was very fortunate that Louis and Tom Ingram, who was very experienced, who I'd worked with for five years, were available. And Bill Koch was coming over, and he can talk about this, from the <coughs> Attorney General's office over to be my, my counsel. So I didn't, he was in the middle of all of this, but those were the only three that I saw John and, and the two I talked with the most were, were Louie and Tom and I was, I simply had to rely on my own judgment and my own instinct. I made a number of other calls, which we can talk about later, but not really for advice. Uh, I, 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 I had to make up my own mind about what to do and then Louie and Tom helped me in some of the conversations that will be described tonight. Could I just take, uh, take, uh, you back for a moment um, and let me ask Hal and maybe maybe ask both of you uh, together to t try to recreate for those of us who are interested <coughs> vitally interested some of us uh, the nature of that first call how um, you could have talk, called and some might say Griffin Bell uh, must have ex might have expected a call uh, under the circumstances, but you decided to pick up the phone and call Lamar Alexander. You're a Democrat, Blanton's in office. You're the first state judge he named after he was sworn in. And now uh, you're about to call Lamar Alexander. Talk about what's in your head and heart uh, and what prompted you to do what you, what you thought you had to do. Well, first of all, I want to say uh, I didn't want to make that call either, Lamar. It was, it was, it was tough. Uh, and another interesting thing you said was we've never discussed this over the years, and I never discussed it with Bill Leach. And Bill and I were very close, and we worked on a, a lot of cases together, but but we never discussed it. I never discussed it with. Uh, well, sometimes we'd say late at night, well, let's get together and let's talk about that, but we never did. And the same with uh, Justice Henry, uh, the speaker. I was very fond of him, and he and I would often say, well, let's talk about that sometime. And I, I never had that, well, I did have that conversation with Lieutenant Wilder a couple of times that we ought to talk about it, but we never did. Uh, which I, I think is interesting in reflecting uh, on all of this. But to try to put it in context, the, the United States Attorney is in a unique position as, as, as the chief federal law enforcement officer that he gets a lot of information every day about things that are going on uh, in the area. And, and the information about Governor Blanton was just accumulating. It was just getting larger and larger and larger. And <clears throat> it, it was becoming quite obvious as to what was going on in the state. John spoke about the 52 pardons that were done by the governor at around midnight 
on Monday, I believe, uh, January the 15th. But that previous Saturday, we had received information that the governor is getting ready to, to issue some pardons and some commutations. Uh, it's going to be quite large, and it's going to be uh, involving several suspects. So we had advanced some in advanced information that that was going to take place on, uh, on, on Monday or, or, or perhaps Tuesday. Well, the, the next event was at midnight on, on January the 15th, Governor Blanton issues 52 pardons and, and commutations, and I think 34. All of, the, all of these people had been rejected by the Board of, of Pardons and Parole, so they'd had their case before pardons and parole and been rejected. If memory serves me correctly, there were 34 murderers uh, on, that, on that list. Uh, there, there was a lady who poisoned her mother and her father-in-law. Uh, there was a triple murderer. There was a torture murderer. There were, <clears throat> there, were, there were only three pardons that night, and one of them involved a former sheriff down in, uh, in Humphreys County, I believe. And, but they'd already served their terms, the, the ones that he pardoned. These others involved commutation, was their time served, and so forth. So, I, I mean, this sent... I think it's fair to say a, a shockwave uh, across uh, the nation, uh, literally. But to, to go to, to January the 17th, uh, I, I got up that morning and, and had this situation on my mind. I didn't have any, any sort of remedy. And I, I remember I paced a lot that morning up and down the corridor. And I came back to my office and <clears throat> This agent came up to me and he said, you know, you got to know this. He said, you're not going to believe this. And he proceeded to tell me the latest information. And I said, you know, surely, I mean, really, I mean, is this right? That information was more and more and more. More and more uh, information. And, and I said, you know, uh, you, you, you got to double check this. You, you know, go and, and, and look into this again. And uh, I mean, this is serious business. And <clears throat> he did. Also gave him a list of, of see there'd been a there'd been a previous arrest in, in December of, unfortunately of, of governor's council and, and and we had videotaped his security guard talking about who's going to be pardoned and how much it's going to cost and uh, <laughs> uh, aside from that I, I suggested that, uh, that you know you got ready to shut that down I said why don't you just ask this guy uh, we were talking about paying all this money and so forth. Why, why don't you just ask him for the hell of it? Why, why don't you ask him about James Earl Ray? Can we get James Earl out? <laughs> it was funny on, on the video. It, it kind of took him back, and he kind of paused and looked at us. Said, Damn, that's a hot one. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think we'd pardon him. But 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 what if we arranged it for him to escape? <clears throat> so you know, you knew right then that everything was for sale. But anyway, the, 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 the long story short, the, the agent came back with what I thought was substantial evidence and corroborated evidence, and um, he uh, he said, "What the hell are you going to do about it?" And I told him, "I said you don't want to know," uh, and I felt like that I I should not share this with my staff. I shouldn't share it with the FBI because I represented them, and I thought if this thing goes south. There could be only one person to blame, that's me. And so they didn't know about it. And so the, the, the FBI did not know what was going to take place. and uh, Did not know you were going to call they, they had the no, governor. They had no idea that I was going to call uh, Lamar and, um, and urge him. And, and I remember calling him, and I, I remember the first thing I said was, I'm not calling you as the United States Attorney, I'm calling you as the Tennessee and we went from there. <laughs> but that was the context. So what did he say? Well, he, he said, I, I, think he, I think he did say, well, let me call you back, Al. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, here's a guy, you know, he's young, he's handsome, he's got all these bands coming in from all over the state, you know, and cheerleaders, and, you know, he's walking around in his T-shirt and, and, and blue jeans on, it's the greatest day in his life. 
And here's this idiot called him up saying, you know, I think you ought to take off this early. And <laughs> that'd be a shock to him. Uh, but then he got back to me and, and, uh, and we discussed the, the information that I had and uh, at, at some length. And um, then he wanted me to get in touch with Bill Leach, the Attorney General, and I did, and, and Bill and I met, and then we got in touch with the uh, Lieutenant Governor and uh, the Speaker, and- Did you call Ned McWhorter and John Wilder after calling Bill Leach? Yes, and I, was, I, I called all three of them. And, and how were, <clears throat> did you take their temperature? And was, yeah, I, and did they all agree? Were they all as uh, as concerned as well as you were? They they were concerned, but what they wanted to do was was, was say, "Tell Lamar, uh, we'll stand behind him." <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Lamar was not looking for that. He, he wanted somebody. Well, first of all, Lamar, my recollection is he he wanted them to urge him to. Uh, become uh, I see you nodding and Lamar so, and that and is there, what you want so there was this little difference of opinion between them as to what position they should take and and we went through a lot of conditions that <clears throat> we thought ought to take place um, I remember you wanted me to appear with you uh, at the swearing in and, and I told you I couldn't do that I didn't think and we finally agreed that wouldn't be a good idea but we went through many many issues including well, what do we do if, if uh, I mean, he, he's the commander in chief of the National Guard. I mean, what, what do we do uh, if he has his security people to bar us and uh, should it be a, there's a confrontation? And, and we talked about the law. We talked about all the things that could go wrong, uh, possibly. But like Lamar said, I mean, I knew when I called him, I, in, in my heart, I, I knew you were going to do it. Let me ask Lamar, uh, that's, uh, I hadn't thought that much about the governor as commander of the National Guard, but the Guard could have gone to the state capitol and could have barred uh, your entry. Um, I know that you sent Louis Donaldson and Tom Ingram over there at some point. And Bill Cope. And Bill Cope. Uh, so you brought Leach into it, like and Attorney Attorney General Leach has an assistant named Bill Koch. And Bill, I don't know who got you, well, how early you were brought into it, but talk about, talk about that call comes from Hal Harden to the State Attorney General Bill Leach, um, Democrat to Democrat, about a governor who's a gut Democrat, what's the atmosphere in the office? Uh, and what, how does Bill Leach react uh, to this information that he's gotten from the U.S. Attorney? Well, uh, Gov General Leach had only been the Attorney General for under a year at that time, and, and this was a particularly challenging week for him. On Tuesday, he was actually in Washington. I happened to be with him arguing a case in front of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, so we were actually out of town for that infamous Monday. Uh, and uh, General Leach was also, his wife was giving birth to his son at a Baptist hospital. At that that very day. That very day. So uh, uh, what was going on was that he was juggling a whole lot of balls. Now, the, the Attorney General's opinion that had coincidentally been, been released earlier in, Jan in January in response to an opinion request from Victor Ash, Senator Victor Ash, at the time it was issued, was not viewed as anything of any cosmic importance. Uh, Senator Ash was known to write bevies of opinion requests, and we had several assistants in the office who spent most of their time answering <laughs> Victor's questions. <laughs> they were mostly hypothetical questions. They were mostly ones that would never come to pass, but on uh, January 3rd of 1979, an opinion had been released that said, in fact, uh, the governor did not have to wait to take the oath of office until the inauguration day. And that passed without notice. Uh, when the, the, uh, the, the fur hit the fan 
on Monday night. Excuse me, this, this is the result of Senator Victor Ash asking the Attorney General, Bill Leach, for an opinion, and that is the opinion unrelated to what we've just heard. That's on the, that, that's already a matter of record. That's right, it's a hypothetical Got it, request it's hypothetical, yes. Of an opinion's rendered. Well then, Monday night occurs, and all of a sudden that opinion becomes a little bit more relevant, and uh, General Leach uh, decides that he's perhaps uh, not solidly in back of that opinion. So he decides <laughs> that it needs to bear some reconsideration, and as I recall on Tuesday, uh, a, a, a revised opinion is rendered that does not retreat from the first opinion, but says that a court could find that the governor is required to take the oath of office on the inauguration day. Now, what went on after the phone calls to governor-elect and the two speakers is that the fulcrum became Bill Leach. If Bill Leach did not say that the Constitution permitted the governor-elect to take the oath of office early, neither the speakers nor the governor-elect was going to do it. So what happened that afternoon was uh, that, that in a hotel across the street from the federal courthouse, there is a smoke-filled room where we have Hal Harden, Bill Leach, Hayes Cooney, and me, and our job is to come down on one place. Can so let me just, let me, um, Article 2, Section 4 says the governor should be elected for four years. Four years, that's, that's in writing. Article 5 says state house representatives shall have the sole power to impeach. So how do you explain it? Uh, and, but you do have that opinion that says he can leave office, the so-called Ash opinion, the Ash opinion. There's one, other, there's one other provision of the Constitution. It's Article 7, Section 5 that says the term of the governor begins on January 15th. And therefore, we had a cir circumstance where we believed that the Constitution did not tell us we could do it. And that was that very day, the 15th. That's right. The Constitution did not tell us we could not do it. And so we finally determined that only three requirements had to be met to have a, a governor effectively take office. One was the organizational session of the General Assembly had to start, and by the Constitution that started on January 15th. Secondly, the results of the governor's election had to be certified, and in fact they had been certified. So the only remaining uh, item that had to be taken care of was the governor taking the oath. And so ultimately after uh, uh, many cigarettes and yelling and screaming and pacing around in that hotel room, <laughs> Uh, the four lawyers finally decided that we were going to hang together, and uh, General Leach felt comfortable that he would inform the governor-elect and the two speakers that it was his considered opinion that taking the oath on January the 17th was consistent with the Tennessee Constitution. And once he said that without any equivocation, uh, the two speakers and uh, the governor-elect said then we'll move forward, and we then said about the mechanics of arranging for the ceremony that happened at 5.55. So let me, let me see. Um, governor Alexander has, our governor-elect Alexander still, has sent Louis Donaldson over to confront the National Guard if it shows up <laughs> no, and, and lock no, down that, the Capitol. Did that, that come, come that early? That, that's later. No, that happened a after, after, after actually, I was we were down in the parking lot before the oath, and <laughs> the question was raised, what do you do about the Capitol? And the <clears> governor-elect <throat> said to, Louis and Tom Ingram and I go over and secure the Capitol <laughs> as soon as I've taken the oath. Be ready for the National Guard. It may be on the way. <laughs> well, which, which, if I may add, which somebody said Louis Donaldson has been waiting his whole life for someone to ask him to do that. <laughs> Fred Thompson. But, but to go, go ahead. John, I, 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 I won't inter interrupt much, but just to go on what, what, Hal, what Hal and Bill said, the back and forth was... The, the speakers said, you go first, we'll back you up. I wasn't about to do that. I said, you ask me to do it, and I'll agree to do it. And they weren't going to do that. And what we actually came to was a sort of grand compromise, which I wrote out longhand, saying that we jointly agree 
And they, I called them on the phone and read that to them, and they agreed with it on the phone. And then I, and then I, I, I read, read that. So we, it, in a way, it was, it gave me a chance to form, an ability to work with them, you know, which lasted for the whole eight years. Sure. By, by in that crucible of two or three hours, by resolving how to do that, and Bill's exactly right. I don't think anything would have happened if, if General Leach, if Hal, Bill, General Leach, and Hayes Cooney hadn't cause Leach to come to the conclusion <laughs> that it was authorized under the Constitution. So let me move for a moment, uh, Fred Thompson. Um, by this time, you're off in Washington. Uh, with Senator Baker, you've become a nationally known lawyer. You've played a key role in Watergate hearings. Uh, you're up there now going about your own law business. And then you get this urgent call from the governor-elect. Help! Help right now. Uh, come on down here. Um, what was your reaction? What did you do? What were you asked to do? And once here, how did you carry out what you had been asked to do? Yeah, I think that morning I had been over at the Hobbs Road place and uh, I had had, uh, you know, was with legions of others uh, helping with regard to transition issues and all, and had gone to Washington that day. I was at the offices of, uh, of Westinghouse, and uh, I don't remember who called, actually. I think it was somebody on Lamar's behalf and uh, told me to come back. He wanted me to come back. And I don't remember the details of it. My recollection is, or lack of recollection is, that uh, I got on the plane to come back without knowing why. Now, there has been talk, as I think about it and, and, and listen uh, tonight, uh, there had been talk about this. So you get a call and say, come, and without knowing really why, yeah. you came. Yeah. And, and uh, well, I knew, you know, that's probably the reason. Well, you knew he needed help. You know, that's what. Reason. You know, that's the thing about all of this. All of us knew each other, you know, in one way or another. Sure. And, and of course, Lamar and I go, go way, way back. And, and uh, besides, he'd just been elected governor. Nothing more than you need a good governor. Uh, uh, so I wanted to uh, you know, be happy. So, But uh, <laughs> seriously, I, I got on the plane, came back, was met by two highway patrolmen. And I think that's the first time that I knew that he had uh, – Announced while I was in the air, I think that he was appointing me to review his <laughs> commutation. <laughs> so, uh, and there's a stack of them waiting on you. I'll tell you. Yeah, it, it, it's very presumptuous on his part. I mean, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I I, uh, I landed and uh, was taken to the Capitol, and as I recall, Louis was there, and. Uh, So by this time, Louis has arrived and has locked down the count. Is down. the Capitol locked when you get there? Yeah. How do you get in? Well, not literally. It, it just it just had a highway patrolman station about every five feet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, How'd you get by them? And uh, well, you know, they, they were under 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 the illusion that I was somebody important, so they didn't know. <laughs> uh, I was there on the go. And they talked to Louis, and they knew he <laughs> was important. <laughs> Besides, I said I knew Mr. Thompson. So, but but my role really was after that, and uh, and it was uh, reviewing with uh, Tom Hull, who was on my legal team, the uh, the commutation. You know, there was a, a big uh, uh, you know mess. You had these commutations. First of all, my recollection is the governor had already let a bunch of them out. Uh, not these, not this bunch necessarily, but but others that he had already. My recollection is that particularly Fred Humphreys was not out. No, he was he was not. He was one of that fifty-two. Right. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, some 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 of these commutations had been delivered. Some had not, and uh, turned out to be a, 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 a big legal issue. And, and Wilkins, correct me if I'm wrong. The Court of Appeals, I think, re 
wrote the opinion on it, the Supreme Court did not hear it, and considered them, as you can imagine, all the prisoners who didn't get out, you know, they paid good money and still didn't get out. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them. But uh, uh, they were filing lawsuits. John J. Hooker, of course, filed a, an amicus uh, uh, lawsuit uh, about some of them. Lamar instructed <coughs> us to, to review them and see if any of them were merit that did not get out were, or, or, and not delivered were meritorious. And we found a few were and made, made that recommendation. And Lamar uh, signed their commutation later on. But, but the issue of delivery was a big one because legally it had to be delivered. And the Court of Appeals, as I recall, held uh, that uh, some, and somebody had, had told uh, the governor's office, who apparently was trying to do something good, uh, uh, told the warden or someone to forewarn him. Was that you? <laughs> and, uh, well, definitely trying to do something good. <laughs> But the but the court of appeals said you know we can't we can't let the, that slow walking you know be the determinant uh, if the governor's intention was to do it and he expressed no intention to change his mind about doing it in this case it constitutes delivery so the court took care of, of, a, of a big chunk of those as as I uh, as I recall uh, so as I understand that. That means his signature, if he really intended to put it there, uh, is binding. Yes. Yeah, and, and it gets back to another point. You know, I, th I think, uh, I think what, what Hal and Lamar did uh, was more, I guess the right word is courageous, and then even looking back on it now. Uh, you know, pardons are, are, are very powerful, very powerful stuff. You know, you, we, we consider it on the, on the national level, and I forget what differences there might be in terms of the governor's power than the president's. But that is an absolute rascal, and it doesn't matter whether or not the guy deserves the pardon. Look, look what Haley Barber of, of Mississippi is going through right now. He made the decision that these people uh, deserved uh, commutation on his way out the door, and they got it. Uh, and we'll get it. So it doesn't, it wasn't just a matter of him giving some bad commutation. It was a matter that they were, that they were apparently going to be paid for. And, and, and what would have happened if, in fact, uh, the case had turned out and, the, and <coughs> maybe didn't it develop the way many cases do? And that is, you're, 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 it's not exactly what you see. What it seems. What if it turns out that you could improve? I don't even know the route in anybody's mind or knew anything about it, you know, what, what the deal was, but could we legally prove in a court of law beyond a reasonable doubt that money was changing hands and, and stuff? Uh, Hal took a big risk that, that this thing could have turned real, and of course not all of them were, were convicted of that, were convicted of other things, but um, it, it, it became it became apparent to everybody, and it's a part of the, of the record now, that it was an administration with a legal counsel uh, and others were taking money up there and, and for, for these things, and, and it turned out that their information was correct. But not necessarily. I remember on Lamar's side, I don't know, we've never talked about this, Howard Baker told me somewhere in the proceedings before uh, the 17th, I recall this thing had been kicked around in the news for a couple of days, and uh, he, he was very concerned about you taking the vote. Uh, he, he was very reticent about it, and, and of course he's 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 a, he's a uh, person everybody at this table uh, you know knows and respects, and, and a knowledgeable lawyer, and a, and a very knowledgeable mm -hmm. lawyer. But all the things take that scenario I just laid out from Lamar's standpoint. Well, you know he got in there. Destroy the Democratic Party by making this a big issue. Turned to find out, you know, they didn't do half the stuff that you know they they thought. Case after case turns out that way many many times. So it doesn't look like it made it as much now, but both of these guys intentionally, even under the the present circumstances. I mean, the other people who joined hands and agreed and so forth, you know, they're they're just names. But 
these would be the guys who everybody would remember who made the decision. Bob Cooper, you, um, this was 34 years ago, and uh, you were not Attorney General. <laughs> but your father was a justice on the Tennessee Supreme Court. Again, I'm relying on Keel Hunt for this information, who interviewed your father on his 91st birthday, I think. And his father, your father told Keel, I think, um, that he had grave reservations about this. Uh, reservations about Joe Henry as Chief Justice, swearing in the governor-elect three days early. Um, if that's true, did you know it, and did you talk to him? <coughs> Have you talked to him about it? Uh, did you talk to him about it uh, then or the in, in the ensuing years? Well, John, I'd uh, first say I, I didn't talk to him at the time uh, for the very good reason that uh, at that time I was in the middle of final exams uh, in my senior year in college. <laughs> uh, and so I feel uh, <laughs> you know, I'm honored to be a part of this uh, August group, but I can't uh, claim to be a, uh, a player in this. Um, <laughs> So, so no, I didn't talk with my dad about it at the time, but uh, I did. I have talked about with him about it since then, uh, and in, including just uh, called him up over the weekend uh, to uh, refresh myself on this. And um, you know, he said that when he did learn of the event, that he was immediately concerned that uh, taking the oath uh, by Governor Agnesander, taking the oath before the date that had been set by the legislature uh, for the oath to be administered uh, would put a cloud uh, over any future official actions uh, by the new governor uh, and uh, would encourage lawsuits. Uh, and so uh, he uh, specifically discussed and strongly urged uh, Chief Justice Henry uh, to make sure that in the regularly scheduled inauguration, mm -hmm. uh, which was that Saturday, uh, January 20, uh, that uh, the governor signed a second oath, to have him sign a second oath, and to make sure that that second oath was also filed with the Secretary of State, so that if there was going to be any legal challenge, uh, that it would be limited to that three-day period uh, and would be cut off uh, as of January 20. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not aware that uh, Governor <coughs> Alexander took any substantive actions between in that three-day period. And in any event, there were no lawsuits challenging the legal validity uh, of the January 17 oath. Let me uh, ask, go back to Fred for a moment and then come back to you, Bob, with another question. Um, Fred, again, I'm relying on, on Keel Hunt, I think, for this story. Uh, Do you remember sitting in the governor's office, locked in, <laughs> with Louis Donaldson, and a call comes from Aubrey Harwell on behalf of Governor Blanton? You recall that? Yeah. And he, he says, Governor Blanton left something in his desk drawer. He wants it. Mm -hmm. I don't know the rest of the story. Would you tell us? What was it, and did he get it? Yeah, he got it, and uh, <laughs> the ravages of time are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my I, world. I, I, uh, uh, Aubrey called me. He said, there's an envelope in his desk. It's personal. It has nothing to do with any of this, and uh, he'd like to have it if he could have it. was in it? That was uh, my question. That, that, <laughs> that, that I do not remember. Uh, I called Aubrey today, and I'm happy to report neither does he. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I probably, I don't recall looking at it. I, I, um, I had in my mind at one time that it, whether somebody told me or somebody was a 302 or FBI, 
I think more than likely, I took Aubrey at his at his word that it was question and sentence form. Bob, one of the wonderful opportunities three decades later is to consider what lessons have been learned from all this. And this may be the most difficult question of all. Without considering anything that has happened since in Tennessee or anywhere else, as Fred says, Mississippi, um, can you comment on, given the same circumstances today, would you have made the same decision as Attorney General as Bill Leach made 34 years ago? Well, John, I appreciate you giving me some advance warning uh, on this question. Um, he did, he did. Uh, and uh, so, you know, let me give uh, what will be perhaps a little bit of a lengthy answer because I want to explain. But this is obviously a difficult question and so difficult that, as uh, Justice Koch has already noted, uh, General Leach's office issued two different opinions uh, within 13 days uh, on this question. First, that the oath could be administered early, and second, that courts could rule to the contrary that it shouldn't have been issued early. Uh, and I guess I would say, John, that I think both opinions reached the right result. Um, <laughs> I would have told the speakers that an early oath was legally defensible under the Tennessee Constitution, although not for the reasons uh, that the office gave in the first uh, January 3rd opinion uh, that Justice Koch talked about. But I would also have to have cautioned them that this was uncharted territory uh, with no guarantee of success in the courts. And the reason for that, and let me uh, go into a little bit of the professorial mode here. You know, this dispute centers on the Tennessee Constitution, Article 2, Section 8, which states that the General Assembly meets an organizational session in January after each election. And then here's the key language, quote, at which session, if in order, the governor shall be inaugurated, close quote. Now, the written opinion on January 3rd tried to get around that language by arguing that it didn't apply to taking the oath of office because an inauguration is, quote, a, simply a ceremonial celebration, close quote, and doesn't necessarily involve an oath. Well, I mean, personally, I think that's unpersuasive, that I don't know why the state constitution would write into its provisions the date on which you would have the inaugural gala. Um, so I don't think you can have an inauguration without an oath. In fact, if you're going to try to do that sort of parsing of the language, I wouldn't focus on the word inauguration. I'd focus on, quote, at which session. I mean, that's pretty ambiguous. You know, it could simply mean the oath would be taken during the course of the organizational session. That is, at any time between when the uh, legislature convenes an organizational session and adjourns sine die. But the historical practice was for uh, the governor to be inaugurated on a date set by joint resolution of the General Assembly. And in fact, the 1979 General Assembly had set that date by joint resolution for January 20. So I think you've got to take Article 2, Section 8 head on. And so I would make these points. First, to go with just to what Justice Koch said, Blanton's term ended on January 15. And that, I think, is a critical point in support of swearing in Governor Alexander as soon as possible. Uh, and I would add that Blanton suffered no constitutional injury from moving up the inauguration from January 20 to January 17. Now, you're probably wondering, well, if his term ended on January 15, why was he still in office? And that's because the Constitution says that every new governor's uh, that, you know, that while every new governor's term starts on January 15, uh, it also allows holdovers. The incumbent holds office both until the end of his term and until the successor is elected and qualified. Now, that's been around in the Constitution since 1796, likely reflects the difficulties of travel in those days. Um, but Having holdovers, particularly in the governor's office, is undesirable. You, know, you have a new governor who's been elected, reflects the people's will, and there's a great value in getting that person into office as soon as possible, particularly to replace someone who had not faced the voters for four years. So bottom line, Blanton had no constitutional expectation to serve past his term of January 15. And then I would say the citizenry of Tennessee 
suffered no constitutional injury from moving up the oath of office by three days and not holding it in a joint session. Again, as Justice Koch noted, all that the Constitution requires of a new governor is that he be elected and qualified to hold the office, and those qualifications are age, and Governor Alexander met that, citizenship, he met that, and swearing an oath to uphold the office. And once those have been done, the popular will has been satisfied. Now, the only body with an interest in setting the date and the place of the inauguration is the General Assembly. And it was, in fact, the two speakers of the General Assembly who were seeking permission to do this early. Uh, now, I don't know why the 1870 Constitution said that it should be done at, at the session. Uh, maybe it was supposed to be symbolic. But in any event, there is no substantive purpose to that requirement. It's strictly a ministerial function. And I would say, as a prerogative given to the legislature, you know, setting that, the date, time, place, and agenda, all involve internal operating uh, policies and procedures of the legislature, legislative branch and are within that branch's sole jurisdiction. You know, some constitutional requirements are not well suited for judicial enforcement, and this is probably one of them. I don't think the court would want to get involved in that sort of political issue. And then if a new governor doesn't respect that prerogative, then that's a matter between the legislative and the executive branches. And again, I think the courts would be reluctant to intervene in that. So that if the General Assembly didn't want to follow their leaders and wanted to take retribution on the governor for not being sworn in as they said, then they could have tried to undermine his political agenda, claimed he was Ill illegitimate uh, due to the manner of his inauguration. And that's why I think it was crucial that Governor Alexander did have the two speakers there as well as the constitutional officers to demonstrate that both branches were in agreement as to the legitimacy of this event. So my advice to the speakers would have been that if they wanted to go forward with this on January 17, I could vigorously defend that in court. But given the uncertainty of the question, I would also have advised the new governor once he was sworn in to play it safe, keep his pen in his desk, and take no official action until after the second inauguration on January 20. Fred, you had yeah. a... Maybe we can coax another opinion or two out of this. <laughs> what would have happened, given, going back to the risk that these men took, what would have happened, acknowledging now that uh, some court might have decided that, uh, that swearing in was, was not legally valid, where would that leave those prisoners who Blanton was going to commute on that last day? Well, they would have been released. Oh, boy, that's another question. It uh, sure is. No, wait, clar I mean, clar clarify your question. Now, there, there were a number of files sitting on his counsel's desk that he hadn't signed yet. So, you know, th it would be difficult to argue that they would be entitled to clemency because the documents hadn't been Well, would you, you certainly would have. I, my recollection is there was some information that he was that, that he had planned to sign a lot on his last day, and that would have been subsequent to this. Uh, when the twentieth uh, or something, mm -hmm. uh, and he would swear, obviously, at, at, uh, in such a proceeding that would you know find its way into the court several months later, after the new governor had been validly sworn in. He would swear that he was had a pen in his hand to be get ready to sign it or words to that equivalent and you, you you couldn't and you might have other evidence and he might actually be telling the truth but he would have done that uh had he been allowed to do what the court is now saying he was entitled to do he took away one of the absolute powers that the governor had where would that leave those individuals I suppose, I suppose any one of them could have gone to court, sought to assert rights. Well, they certainly but would. I don't know where it would have gone beyond that. But that again, that goes back to the risk. I mean, you you were, <laughs> you know, the risk was real. Yeah, there's a lot of things yeah. that could have happened. Uh, let me say, John. I mean, one way to avoid this problem in the future personal is personal lawsuits. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Yeah. That's yeah. what yeah. I meant. Let me yeah. exactly. personal lawsuits against these people. Mm -hmm. One, one way to avoid this problem in the future from ever coming up again is to follow the federal model. You know, the federal constitution says that the president's term categorically ends every four years at noon on January 20. There is no such thing as a holdover president. 
So certainly, uh, Tennessee could consider uh, swearing in the new governor every four years on January 15, uh, as we in fact did with Governor Haslam uh, last year, regardless of what week of the de day of the week it falls on. Uh, and that would avoid this problem, but then it also would mean we couldn't hold inaugurations regularly on Saturday, for which there are obviously you know, uh, um, you know, no ease of attendance uh, issues there. You know, I think about I think about this moment, and I think about um, what's happening at the state capitol. I think what's happening at U.S. Attorney's office, at Lamar's house, and at uh, that office uh, there on Hobbs Road. I, I know the answer to this question, I think, again, thanks to Keel. But the question is, had anybody told Governor Blanton? Um, and who did? Well, well first of all, let, let me say, all of this was done in absolute secrecy because we were concerned that if word did get out that the commutations and the pardons were going to be signed. And as I recall, his legal counsel wanted to leave the Capitol with the commutations and pardons and had them in hand and, 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 and Louis said, no, you're not gonna do it. And Bob Lillard was a man, I think he was six, seven. I mean, he was a huge guy. Bob and Lillard had succeeded at, 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 at Eddie Sisk. At, had succeeded at Eddie Sisk, who'd been arrested. And, and, and Louis Donaldson said, no, you're not gonna do that. And Bob Lillard says, by whose authority? And this time, he had not even been sworn in anything, but he just looked up at him and said, by the authority of the governor of the state of Tennessee, we will not take commutations out of the Capitol. <laughs> so I think that's a true story, Bill. I, that was his letter to me. It, it is, and the answer to your question, though, is that the in the roving room off the Supreme Court building, the participants in the swearing in had gathered the constitutional officers, the the two speakers, uh, the governor-elect and his family. So this is in the roving room, and you're with the chief justice who's about to swear in the governor. And, and the, the group is preparing to walk out, as you saw in the film, to take the oath. And, and you're getting ready to go into the courtroom and take the oath. And, and the discussion is that, that out of courtesy, the governor, Governor Blanton, needs to be called. And uh, that job usually falls to the lawyer. So Bill Lee made the call. Is it possible that Ned McCordick made the call and said to the trooper at the mansion or the residence, let me speak to the governor, and that Ned then said, Governor Bill Leach has something he wants to tell you? Well, actually, we have Governor McWhorter saying that <laughs> on video. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Jim Kennedy, his assistant, had Governor Blanton's new residential address. So Kennedy dialed the phone. Uh, Miss Blanton answered. Uh, <laughs> Kennedy handed the phone to Governor to Speaker McWhorter. Speaker McWhorter said, "May I speak to the governor or to Governor Blanton?" And while he was holding to get Governor Blanton on the phone, when Governor Blanton said yes, he handed the phone to Bill Lee. Well, it's such a good story. I wanted to <laughs> be sure we got it in. <laughs> I, I, with Connie's permission, I'd like to entertain. Uh, uh, couple, three questions from the audience, if, if you have any. I, I, as you know, there, there are an awful lot of questions that I've asked and many questions that I haven't. So it, is there a question there? Yes. Bill Koch does, I think. <laughs> I mean, do we know Would you repeat the question? Do we know what happened to the 52 who got out? I, I don't think we know where they are today. Uh, but there were, as Fred said, there were about 25 or 30 that had actually been released. Uh, matter of fact, Roger Humphreys, the center of this storm, had, had been represented by the former state attorney general, and he was long gone from the prison even before the press found out. Uh, 
uh, we had instructed the Commissioner of Correction not to release any further inmates, uh, and those inmates were in fact not released, and there were three lawsuits that were filed contesting the validity of that release. Fred and the Governor, uh, and with my help, reviewed those remaining commutations, and Fred's right, we actually granted, I don't remember, it could have been 10 or 12 of them that were meritorious, and they were released. The rest remained in prison until we had hearings before the Court of Criminal Appeals where they found, just like they did in Marbury versus Madison, that the commission did not have to be delivered. Uh, and uh, upon that decision by the Court of Criminal Appeals, we did not appeal that to the Supreme Court and directed that the remaining inmates be released, and they were. Question here. No, we went ahead on Saturday the 20th as scheduled. So everything was done. The, the, only, the only thing unusual about it, uh, and, and this gives me a chance to, 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 to make a point, was I uh, the things that were critical to me were, number one, would, would the Attorney General say it was constitutional? This was not a hard decision for me, given that. I mean, Leach had told me before, the Attorney General, I once asked him, could the governor empty the prisons if he chose to? He said, yes. In other words, he has the absolute power to empty the prison. I had that in my mind. And so when Hal Hardin called me and told me what he told me, <coughs> and, and I had enough respect for him and the office he held to say, you put those two things together, I've got a hot potato in my hand I'm going to have to deal with. So the only things that made a difference were, would the Attorney General say, it was constitutional. Number two, could I get the two speakers to join me, not urge me, but join me? Because it had, I had in my mind, it had to be a legislative ceremony. Three, could I get all the Democrats I could find surrounding me so that it would not look like a coup? Th those were the things. And finally, there are only three participants in the traditional transfer of power in our country. There's the incumbent, there's the new person, and there's the chief justice who swears in a new person. One of the three was not going to be there, either at the early swearing in on the 17th or on the 20th, probably for the first time in our history. So I felt it was especially important that Justice Henry be present to swear me in because the picture we have is the chief justice, the president, or the Chief Justice and the Governor and the, and, and the old Governor. So we had two of the three people there on the 17th, and we had two of the three there on the 20th, and we did it. And we did it on the 20th just as we had planned to do it. And based on the legal advice I got, I took no actions on the 18th or 19th or 20th until I had taken the oath the second time. Matter of fact, you even told the staff that they were not to enter the Capitol until You had been told by the staff? No, Governor. Alexander had instructed the staff not to come to the Capitol until after the second inauguration. I guess I've been told by Coke. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so Coke <laughs> told the governor to tell the staff, don't come to the Capitol. Yeah. Bob would. I was just going to say, uh, Governor, here's a copy of both of your oaths if you would uh, yeah. like to look <laughs> at them. <laughs> I, saw a hand, I saw a hand in the back. And, uh, <laughs> yes. Hey, there's Pat, who was there as a reporter, a young reporter at the time. Pat Nolan? He's a reporter. He's got more than one question he wants to ask. Well, I think I know the answer to that. I think J Justice Koch may, you know, I mean, everything we did, we tried to make it seem as normal as possible, and having it in the Supreme Court chambers offered that opportunity. It was also convenient. I don't know any more than that. Well, and it, 
No one was expecting something in the Supreme Court chambers. It would have been harder to arrange a ceremony for the Capitol or the legislative plaza. And it was the seat of the judicial branch of government, and there was a thought that it added an air of legitimacy to what was going on. I wanted him to do it. Maybe. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> Justice Clark. Who called Chief Justice oh, Henry? Go ahead. Well, we, I, think, I think everybody did. I, I had a. I called Chief Justice Henry. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I called him. I called him earlier that afternoon and said, I'd like to meet with you. Uh, and it sticks out of my mind, Keely and Preston. My memory, I think it's like 3.15, and um, I thought that originally it had been discussed that perhaps everybody should come out to Hobbs Road, and then if all this was ironed out, that the justice would take the oath. I don't think that conversation lasted very long, but I mean, that was one of the many ideas uh, th that was floated. But, but Justice Henry, uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Wilder had some concerns, I wanted to point out too, about there being a conflict uh, with Justice Hen with uh, Justice Henry taking taking the oath, and, and, a, and a conflict for Bill Leach to be involved in that because uh, which which side is he going to represent when there's a lawsuit? Pat, I um, I know you had a second question, and I didn't mean to cut you off. Let me come, let me congratulate a Tennessean reporter on this event, though, as well, that, that after Chief Justice Henry decided that he was going to administer the oath, he, he had been ill, had been in the hospital, went to his office on the third floor of the Supreme Court building, and started researching the issue, and, and Larry Daughtry, uh, a p political reporter for the Tennessean, went up to see Justice Henry, and, and Larry Daughtry, as we all know, could read upside down. <laughs> and he saw that the book open on the Chief Justice's desk was the portion of the code pertaining to the oath of office for the governor. And that's when the Capitol Hill Press Corps decided things must be getting serious. I remember um, talking to Larry that day, and uh, there was a point in, uh, in the proceedings, um, and I was in the editor's office, and I called Hal Harden late in the day and said, what in the hell are you all doing up there? <laughs> and uh, he wouldn't tell me. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I think that we live at a time when there is a strong feeling across the country that, uh, that partisanship and ideology uh, divide and sometimes seem to paralyze decision making. Um, and I, I can't, I can't think about that without remembering that day so long ago, uh, when respect and regard and trust and civility transcended political part partisanship. It was done with the encouragement, support, courage of public officials, cross party lines. Um, I wonder if I could ask any of you, or all of you, if you have any final thoughts about this historic moment, particularly um, if it holds lessons for right now. And then Connie will conclude. 
I'll let, I'll let you go. So you're, you're the senior. <laughs> well, um, yeah, the, these, uh, one is, just for the record, I announced that Fred was coming back to review all the pardons without telling him. I announced it uh, right after I was sworn in. I'd had Tom or Louie call him and ask him to come, come back to do that. Um, and in the afternoon, there was plenty of consideration of what might happen if the governor heard about it. I mean, he is commander in chief of the National Guard. He could have surrounded the Capitol. He is the head of the, of the, the, the Tennessee Highway Patrol reports to him. And Keel and I have talked about it. Apparently, I called Gene Roberts that afternoon, who was the new Highway Patrol head, and asked him if we had 50 loyal Highway Patrolmen who could be on our side. Um, in case there was a conflict, be not only because it might be dangerous, because I was afraid it would make us even more of a laughing stock than we already were because of a governor selling pardons for cash. I was thinking about those things. What goes through my mind about this is, you know, in conclusion is I've always admired what Hal Harden did uh, because, uh, you know, Hal was like me in a sense on the Democratic side, but if there was a promising young Democrat in the state, it was Hal Harden. You know, uh, and and um, by taking this risk based on what he thought was good for his state, you know, he risked his political future in in doing that. Uh, I've never told him uh, that or or discussed it with him, but I always admired him for that. And second, uh, you know, it to me it was a pretty simple decision, really. Uh, hesitant, yes, but you know, I respected Hal in his office. I looked at the background, I, you know, as I said a minute ago, if, if, if the Attorney General said it was constitutional, if the speakers participated, if the justice would come there, um, then, then, uh, then I should do it and I should work real hard with people, Louie, Tom, others I was working with that day, Fred, Bill Coke, to make sure that all the things that could go wrong didn't. And we were very fortunate, really because of the caliber of these other people that, that it didn't. It worked out, it, it, it worked out fine. And maybe the most important thing was, even though my wife, Honey, said that it was the worst day of her life, I'm sure it was, <laughs> and it was bad for me, that it turned out to give me a chance to be a much better governor than I otherwise would have been because um, it, 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 it caused uh, the Democratic leaders of the Senate, even before I became governor, to forge a compromise relationship with me and a way to work. And we worked that way for eight years. And Ed McWhorter often said when asked, uh, the press would say, what are you going to do with this new young Republican governor? He would say, I'm going to help him because if uh, he succeeds, the state succeeds. So it wasn't quite that, you know, peaches. Well, I'd like. <laughs> but that's, but that's, that's the way it worked for eight years. So it helped me be a better governor, and I'm grateful for that experience now. But on that day, I wasn't. <laughs> well, I think that uh, everybody in this audience and everybody I know in the state is grateful to you and grateful to all of you for the action you took that day. And I'll ask this distinguished audience to thank this distinguished panel with a round of applause. <laughs> And Connie tells me we are adjourned. Thank you one and all.